There is nothing as changing as the desert, nothing that changes with the same quiet appearance. The caravans always seem to move over the same dune. They seem to relax crossing some invented courses, courses traced by men who never existed. Still universes in a timeless landscape, without limits. The senses deceive. In the desert, you never step on the same dune. The desert is made of men with a vision of the future, men of fire who fight against oblivion so as not to betray that future. For centuries, Agadez has been one of the largest ports in the universe of the Tuaregs, those mythical blue men of the desert. They lived there among the dunes and mountains of the Air Massif, but they regularly approached the city either to protect it or to attack it. The Azalai, one of the last big commercial salt routes, used to start up from Agadez, and still does. From November to January, hundreds, thousands of camels cross the way between Agadez and the mines of Bilma to further distribute the salt to the rest of the country. After 10 years of war between the rebel Tuaregs and the Niger government, the Azalai caravan travels peacefully again. My name is Hassan El Hayi. I am 10 years old and I am studying in Agadez, although I was born in Tinya, a village located in the mountains. And when I grow up, I want to be a lawyer. My name is Ibrahim Ayu Aliman. I am a Tuareg born in Agadez. I am studying at secondary school, and when I finish, I want to be a doctor. Hassan and Ibrahim go to school together although their parents fought on different sides during the war. The Hassan family fought very actively in favor of the rebels. His uncle, whom he lives with in Agadez, was a member of the guerrillas' secret services. On the other hand, Ibrahim's family is pro-government. They have lived in the city for many years and are in favor of keeping on good terms with the government. But these two families have something in common. Both have always been dedicated to the Azalai, the caravan of salt. Neither Hassan nor Ibrahim have ever accompanied their parents on the caravan. The war made the way dangerous, and therefore they did not dare to travel with them. But this year it will be different. This year, for the first time, the caravans will depart in peace and children will leave school for a few weeks to start learning their parents' profession.
Hassan wants to become a lawyer and Ibrahim a doctor. Their respective parents support them as they want their children to be able to enter a world that they have never known. But they also want them not to forget. Their parents want them to fight for the world that they belong to, a world in danger of extinction in the face of the advancing modern world. There is a big difference between Tuareg children who go or do not go to school. The Tuareg who have gone to school no longer have slaves and rarely act violently. The rebellion made access to school very difficult. Some parents were afraid of bringing their children to school, and others thought that we wanted to influence them against their traditions. These children you see here are the engineers and employees of the future, regardless whether they are Tuareg, Hausa or Peul people. Classes are given in French and Tamashek, which is the language spoken by the Tuareg. We try to teach them a basis of general knowledge without forgetting those aspects of tradition that we consider essential. Anyway, either using this or any other learning procedure, there is always something more important than the teaching system, to live in peace. The schooling of their children is one of the key factors to persuade the Tuareg people to abandon the nomadic life and to integrate themselves in the modern world. This type of school started at the time of the French colonization. The continuous exodus motivated by the severe drought suffered in 1973 and 1984, together with 10 years of war, have not allowed them to develop the educational system in a regular way. Little by little, parents finally understood that an education meant an advantage to find jobs apart from those of the nomadic breeding of animals, and that consequently, it would also mean an open door to future prospects for their children in a time of crisis such as this. The 10-year struggle between the rebel Tuaregs and the Niger government is the consequence of the process of disintegration that the Tuareg people suffered during the second half of the 20th century. For a very long time, the Tamashek, which is what they call themselves, have dedicated themselves to attacking and protecting the caravans, as well as to collecting taxes for the right to cross their territory. The abolition of slavery in the years of the colony, the elimination of the payment of territorial crossing rights, and the arrival of currencies ruined the basis of the traditional economy, thus destroying the prestige of the nobility. In spite of all that, the Tamashek get on quite well with French people. When independence arrived, however, they began to suffer total discrimination at the hands of the new state that was born under the leadership of the Hausa groups in the south. Rioting broke out in 1991, demanding political autonomy and access to the modern production resources that existed within their territory. The Tamashek culture, as it is represented by the admirers of the exotic, no longer exists. Currently, a new and long struggle is taking place how to accept the challenges of the future without disregarding the traditions. We cannot continue to live in the Middle Ages. The era of feudalism has passed. There are improvements such as trucks, phone or electric light that are basic for development. Things have changed and we must adapt accordingly. We have no other choice. It is indeed nice, the image of the camel caravans walking along the dunes, but the trucks carry seven times more load. 
and five times faster. Caravans must continue to exist. There are thousands of families, my own among them, that depend on these animals, but it is necessary to find new alternatives. A few years ago, a law was established that regulated the transportation of salt, which could only be made by camels and not in trucks. Those are laws to protect the Azalai's permanence, but for how long could the caravan be protected if compared with the truck? The elder must work together with the young people to find these new alternatives. That would be a good thing. I have lived in Agadez for two years with my uncle Kane, my mother's eldest brother. Due to war problems, the Timia school was closed and so it was decided that I would live with my uncle and my aunt. My uncle Kane is a blacksmith. He left the village many years ago and came to town to earn his living. He rarely returns to the village. Mohamed El Hadji is Hassan's father. He lives in Timia, and during the war, he worked as an informant for the rebel groups who were fighting against the government. He was officially working with an NGO to help the refugees, and from that position he provided details about the movements made by the regular Niger troops around the area. His family has always worked on the Azalai. And this year, for the first time in a long time, he will see his caravan depart in a quiet atmosphere. At last, an air of peace can be breathed at the village. Long ago, handicraft work was not made directly by the Tuaregs, but by slaves who stayed at stable camps. The blacksmiths, although more highly esteemed, were part of this group. A nobleman, would never marry a craftswoman. All these habits have changed with time, and nowadays, the relationships among the races are more flexible, and also marriages with members of other ethnic groups are more common. Silver crosses are the most highly prized jewelry among all the work made by the Tuareg craftsmen. There is a different cross design for each city. Timbuktu and Agadez have theirs, and also Timia. It's used for protection, and also as a currency of exchange. In the drought season, these are exchanged for camels, cloth, or food. To make these crosses, they use the beeswax melting technique. The beeswax is heated, shaped by hand, and the mold is covered with donkey dung. Once the wax is melted, they pour molten silver in it. At the end of this process is when you will verify the good skills of the craftsmen in the detail of the drawings that complete the cross. It has been several months since I've seen my parents. At the beginning, I felt very sad when they told me that I must leave Timia and go to Agadez to study. All my friends were in the village, and I never thought about leaving. Now I feel very happy to see these mountains again. Timia is a little village in the heart of the air, in northern Niger. The air is one of the massifs that delimits the Sahara Desert. Since time immemorial, and during the last few years of the most recent rebellion, this steep territory has served as refuge for the Tuareg tribes. Timia is, above all, 
the starting point for the salt caravans that go in and out of the Air Mountains. There are two routes, one in the north, departing from Timia, and another one in the plains, departing from Magadez. Both meet in the Tenede Wells, and then follow the same route to the salt mines. I dream about going back and joining my father at the caravan. When I lived in the village, I remembered that by then, everybody was excited about the preparations for the trip. For weeks, everybody did nothing but talk about the caravan, the stages, about places where water could be found, and also about the fear of being attacked by the army soldiers. A great celebration was organized before departure. Now, I'm coming back to enjoy all that for the first time. Furthermore, there's Ibrahim. Now he's my family in Agadez. He will also go this year with the caravan for the first time. I've not seen him for two days, and I already miss him. If we're lucky, our caravans will join at the wells of Tenere. All of his family have come to welcome him. His father, his mother, and his uncle Gumar, one of his father's brothers who emigrated to Libya during the conflict and who has also returned to join the caravan. Libya backed the Tuaregs, and many left to receive military training there. Gumar was one of them. <laughs> The rebellion was not for nothing. It occurred due to specific reasons. People had no rights. I do not think Tamashek could become an independent country, but indeed I expect it could be possible for our people to regularly enter the public office's jobs. Now, for instance, the Mayores of Agadez is a Tamashek. At those places where rebellion was hard, you could find some Tamashek leading people. My idea is to stay here and work in agriculture. I will try to get some piece of land to dig a well and live off that. Now that we're at peace, I think this land will improve in some years. You cannot imagine the results you can obtain from this land if you really work on it. We're in the middle of the desert, of the mountain, and in spite of that we get corn, oranges and onions. We are self-sufficient and our next objective is to get the road improved, to be able to transport the surplus to Agadez market. The Tamashek have always been aggressive people, and the generations to come will have the opportunity to decide their own destiny. What really counts is peace. If we have peace, there will be a future. In Agadez, Ibrahim and his father have already started the preparations for the imminent departure of the caravan. The market is the point where the journey begins and ends. There the people show the shipment of salt they bring on their return. Just one camel can transport up to 200 kilograms of salt. In Timir, they are preparing the bula, a paste made of dates, millet, and crushed dry cheese, which will be the men's food when they're in the desert. Bula is a high-energy food that, together with tea, is the essential diet for the camel drivers. Over the next few days, they will have a long way to walk, and there is no time to cook. The meals are frugal and fast. Only tea is had in different ways. For the preparation and consumption of tea, time does not exist. By the end of September, the men and women will forget about the rest of their tasks and work exclusively for the Azalai. 
Preparation of the caravan takes several weeks. By the middle of October, everything must be ready for the departure. My mother loves to cook. How I miss those dishes she used to prepare when I was living in Agadez. My aunt also cooks good, but not at all like my mother. When I have a wife, I want her to be just like my mother. The people of Ibrahim's caravan are ordering the hundreds of meters of rope needed to put everything in its place. <laughs> Making rope is one of the most important tasks carried out on the days prior to the departure. They must cut palm leaves, dry them, and then spin them energetically so that they remain strongly tight. At departure time, the camels carry a light load, but on the way back, it will be necessary to tie several tons of salt on the camels' backs. <laughs> This is a task achieved mainly by women, since their hands are slimmer, and so they can do this job much better than men. There is little time left for departure. Very soon everything will be ready and I will walk along the desert with my father and the rest of men. When I was a child, my father gave me a newborn camel and told me that someday we would both walk with him in the caravan. That camel died two years ago. I've buried him right here near the market. Yesterday, my father bought another adult camel for me. I've promised my father to participate in many caravans with this camel. Another essential job to be done is the preparation of the gerbas, the desert water bottles. It's not easy to get water along the route. Wells are often dry, and many kilometers have to be traveled without obtaining any kind of liquid. That's why it's imperative to carry good gerbas that allow people to be autonomous. You can live in the desert without food, but never without water. To make those gerbas, you must kill a goat, skin it, and dry the skin. Once dried, you put it in water, and it is handled until it loses the smell and gains softness. Afterwards, you sew it, you put the finishing touch to it, and finally, you blow inside to verify that there are no holes in it. The legislation on water ownership is very precise, and so fraud may be punished even with expulsion from the community. In this geography, the different elements related to water that is, the irrigation ditch, the garden, or the palm, may have different owners. Mm. 
Ibrahim's caravan is ready to depart. When his father gives the order, this expedition will go towards the spurs of the air to meet with the huge dunes of Tenede. If everything goes all right, in three weeks they will reach the Bilma mines. The Tuaregs have never done anything but trading. And the caravan is the eternal symbol of a world that is fading away. The caravan seems to have always existed, and so it has. For centuries, the Tuaregs have had dealings with all kinds of merchandise, some of them harmless, and some others more questionable. The slave trade had been their main source of income for a long time, although they also worked with salt and precious metals. Agadez, Timbuktu, or Gao were the southern ports, their natural frontier towards the black kingdoms of the Sahel. Upon their arrival in those cities, every caravan should be inspected by the authorities, who will reserve a portion of the load for the king. Only after that will they be able to sell the rest of the merchandise. The attacks were frequent. The Tuareg themselves, who offered their help as protectors and acted instead as attackers if rejected, carried out most of the attacks. Paradoxically, during the colonialism, they lived the best moment of the commercial expeditions. The presence of French troops kept the bandits off the caravan's routes. During the second half of the 20th century, that immutable-looking desert suffered a fatal hit. The arrival of the truck made the camel become a second-class transportation system. Those times when the desert was inhabited by a web of hundreds of thousands of camels eternally crossing the sandy grounds have disappeared. The only routes left as reminders of the past are the Azalai of the salt mines from Taudeni to Timbuktu, that of the Nioro in Mauritania, and Agadez to Bilma. If young people like Hassan and Ibrahim do not prevent it, these will be the last salt caravans. Today is an important day for Hassan. Today, a knife will be given to him. The Tuareg's life is not strongly marked by rituals, but they have some symbolic acts that are important for integration of young people in the adult world. One of them is the gift of the knife and the sword, which all Tuareg men carry with them. The time when these weapons had a real practical value has passed. The last wars have been fought with modern rifles and mortars. Nevertheless, the knife and sword still keep their symbolic value. The blacksmith shows them other works that Hassan's father has ordered to be carried in the caravan. <laughs> and at last, they give him the knife. When he comes back with the caravan, they will give him the sword as well. The 
Fatimiya caravan is about to start, but before departure, a great farewell party will be celebrated. This is not usually done, either at departure or at arrival. The caravan has been a usual thing, a constant element in the desert scenery, and everyday activities are not celebrated. But this time is different. This time, people are conscious of the fact that they are not celebrating just one more caravan, but a re-encounter. Many years of war have passed. What they are in fact celebrating is that there is no war. The celebration starts with a camel's race for the young people. From the time they are five years old, children take care of the animals, and when they are seven, they begin to learn how to ride camels. They will very soon ride at high speed. In such places as Demia, the influence of tradition is still very strong. These parties called fantasy are usually held at weddings. When young people get married, it is quite rare that family ties are not reinforced with the birth of a boy. A boy's birth is much more happily celebrated than a girl's. In due time, the boy will increase the military power of the tribe. In that case, men and women will come to congratulate the mother. But if a girl is born, just the women will. On the seventh day after the birth, and not before, the father will be allowed to see his son. It is then when a name is given to the child. On that same day, and the marabout hangs an amulet from his neck. Boys are circumcised when they are three or four. No excision is performed on girls. When girls are six or seven, they start learning how to make mats and clay objects, and how to spin goat's hair. When they reach puberty, they are given their first woman's veil. When they are 16, young people of both sexes can enter adult society, and that is the moment when they are allowed to participate in the ajal. Ajal means conversation, social intercourse, although it really consists of nighttime musical parties, where single men or widowers and single women can participate. At these reunions, you can breathe the Asri atmosphere. Asri means to run at a runaway bridle. Under the protection of the night and with the complicity of the music, young people stick to one another, exchange some daring caresses and erotic games that end in final intimate encounters quite far from the camp. Until the time of marriage, the sexual freedom of Tuareg women is absolute. The word virginity does not exist in Tamashek. The verb to deflower is translated as to make a hole, the same words they use to drill wells for water. It is not an obligation for the girl to be a virgin to marry.
One of the facts that has most influenced the slow destruction of Tuareg culture is the process of Islamization, which little by little, such as the influence of the Toyota and the radio, has taken possession of every corner of the desert. In spite of that, the Tuareg are firm believers, and the women still keep some ancient rights the tradition grants them. They own their own goods even when married, and it is very unusual for them to marry before being 20. When they get married, the couple lives for one year at the wife's family's camp. Hebrews also practice this habit that already appeared in the Old Testament. Its objective is to guarantee good relationships. After this first year, another feast is celebrated in which the men and women from the husband's camp come close to pretending that they will kidnap the girl. Men scream some of the words of warriors, and the women reply, shouting in panic. <laughs> they surround the young wife's tent and claim her as if from now on she would only belong to their family. In spite of that, or maybe because of it, it is the women who appear to be more reticent to enter the unsafe abyss of the modern world. They are the guardians of tradition. They wait for the man when he leaves with the caravan or when he emigrates abroad. Women carefully consider the pros and cons of abandoning the village to go to the city. They are the womb and the back of the desert. We go at last. My father has talked to me for a long time about this moment. I know that the trip will be difficult, but I don't care. I want to be a doctor, but I'd also like to go with a caravan every year. I do not know whether this is possible. Anyway, the only thing I want now is to remain here and enjoy the trip. The elders say that we must learn how to do this job and further teach it to our sons, and our sons to theirs. When I grow up, I will have four children. Two of them will go to the caravan and the other two will stay in the city. I'm the only son and cannot break myself in two. The moment has also come for Hassan's caravan. It will take several days to go down the air mountains and little by little, the line of camels will fade into the sand of Tenede. The journey out from Timia to the salt mines could last about two weeks. Another seven days will be spent to select and load the salt blocks, and three more weeks to carry them to Agadez, where they will sell them to the highest bidder. With the money obtained, they will buy millet and some other caprice. Hassan's father wants to buy a TV, but in Timia they do not have electricity, so he will also need to buy a generator. He still does not know whether the trip will yield profits enough for all that. The trip stages are long. They start off very early, at dawn, and they walk until the sun is so high that they need to make a stop. The rhythm is weary, but constant. 
hour by hour and day by day, they keep walking the long way towards the salt mines. They walk at least 30 to 35 kilometers per day. Unavoidable cup of tea that relieves their stomachs and comforts their spirits at every stop. People also have a rest at Hassan's camp. The evening has come, and they have to get everything ready to spend the night. Stops are usually made in places sheltered from the wind, at the foot of a hillock, or among the dunes to protect the animals also. The camels must be unloaded and fed, and all the work must be done before the night comes. Sunset in the desert is beautiful, but short-lived. This is the essential moment in Africa. The African sunset is a fleeting view of paradise. The first thing to do when you go out from Air and enter Tenere is to fix your position by finding four stars called tefala. These stars will show you the way. They have the shape of a stake, as if they were four fingers. Do you understand? Yes, yes I do. Then you must pass through the middle of them. Yes, through the middle. These stars indicate your way. And then you keep walking and walking until they are right over your head. Afterwards, Sachi comes out. Sachi comes out in the middle of Tefala, over your nose. And what about Amanar? Doesn't she come out? Isn't that that one by the moon? No, she has not come out yet. Amana comes out when Koka is over your head. Four stars form Amana. Two of them represent the legs and the other two represent the arm. She carries the sword in one arm. The sword? Yes, the sword. And now, when Amana is over your head, that is the time to camp. The time to camp? Yes, that's right. The moment to camp until the next day. All these stars that I have shown you point towards the east. The Azalai's nights are cold and the camps are austere. They carry just one blanket and the teapot. That is all a man needs in the desert. The rest of the things will appear. You don't know from where or how, but they will appear. Whatever the weather is, the three tea ceremony is always celebrated. The first tea tastes bitter, the second tastes milder, and the third tastes sweet. <laughs> After this frugal breakfast, they must start again. The camels will be loaded and the weight duly balanced. The physical condition of each camel must be checked every day to organize the march accordingly. Maybe some animals are wounded, sick or very tired. 
Perhaps they will have to walk through very stony grounds or very high dunes. If the physical conditions of the expedition are acceptable in general, then they choose straight paths, even if those are tough. If most of the animals are quite well, but some of them are somehow bad, these will be placed at the end of the caravan and the march will go slowly. To lose an animal means a tragedy. It's necessary to check carefully all the circumstances and elements that could affect them in any way and act accordingly in due time with the reliability gained during centuries of experience. Before starting, they must thank God for allowing them to go on for another day. Although the Tuareks have not ever been strictly devoted to Islam, they have believed in imps, in the natural laws, and in the strength of the wind and in the sand. Allah was respected, but just on a second plane. The power of the Marabouts, the Islamic religious leaders, increased due to the process of turning land into desert and the fall of the nobles from power. Nowadays, they are the chiefs of the Tuareg community. The caravans move ahead. Hassan's is going down the last foothills of the Air Mountains, a tough ground of black sand that has been molded by the fury of volcanoes. Their facing the big dunes of sand is imminent. Ibrahim's caravan still walks along the stony plains prior to the Tenede's sandy grounds. Both caravans are already very close to one another, just at the entrance of the last wells that lead to the sand sea and the salt mines. The caravan walks with the sun, immune to discouragement, and always in the same direction, always the same steps on sand that was never stepped on before, a changing sand that becomes a dune, a slope, a storm. Men go ahead with one eye on the path and the other on the horizon. They are the guardians of the eternal time of the desert, victims of waiting in silence advancing over the ruins of their own freedom. Hassan and his father have completed the first part of the trip. They're already having a rest and eating bula, the paste of dates, cheese, and millet. The women prepared that food on the days prior to the caravan's departure. They have spent almost one week to reach the well. They will rest for a couple of days, and they will start again later on. <laughs> Ibrahim's caravan also reaches the well. They have spent a little more time, eight days. Since the moments our parents told us we were going to travel with the caravan, we've spoken of nothing else but that. We tried to imagine how it would be to walk along for one day after the other with the animals, how the nights would pass, learning how to guide us by the stars. And now, here we are, together at last. We do know it's still a long way to Bilma, but from now on we will walk close to one another. Our professor told us once that friendship consisted of giving your friend the weapon that causes wounds, as he will use it to defend us. I hope always to stand by Hassan to defend him. Hassan's father and uncle are talking about the future of the caravans. 
They're concerned about the competition from trucks. The agreement for survival of Tagalam is no longer respected. If the trucks arrive in Vilma, they load the salt to be carried down to Niamey. We cannot compete. That is true. We are thinking about some other alternatives. We will leave the salt business, but we cannot abandon our camels. So we would have to go to the city. While both fathers chat, the boys attend Fisinak classes. Fisinak is the Tuareg writing. It's being forgotten, as only the eldest and the most remote nomadic people use it. We must find other options. That of breeding camels and organizing caravans to sell their flesh to Libya is not at all bad. But we must study some other alternatives. And above all, we must keep on fighting to obtain protection and support against the trucks. Our children must have the opportunity to choose. We must try to find a way to keep caravans alive, mainly for our children, whom we have so strongly fought for. The Twadig live in a universe that is changing very quickly. A kind of reality that has nothing to do with the one lived by their parents is waiting for Hassan and Ibrahim. In that future they are supposed to build, there must be a necessary, if uncertain, place for tradition. The Tuareg's tradition is slavery, an eternal war against everyone and even against themselves. But this tradition is also a synonym for dignity, freedom, and identity against the abyss of the future. So it's time for them to find their own place in this world. <laughs>